to thank everyone for having me this morning. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Of course, I'm not grateful for the circumstances that brought me um, here this morning. Um, but again, uh, thank you all. Um, this morning, um, I am our lesson is going to be coming from the book of Job. And I know everybody is familiar with the story of Job, um, how the Lord allowed Satan to test Job, and a lot of calamities befell Job. Um, this morning, I would like to look at the life of Job and look at the things that Job learned and look at how we can apply those things to our lives. Uh, if you would this morning, turn with me to Job uh, chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Job chapter 3, 25 and 26. And this is Job speaking. And Job says, for the thing I feared has overtaken me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I cannot relax or be calm. I have no rest, for turmoil has come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this day and the many blessings of life that you've bestowed upon us, dear God. We're just thankful for the opportunity uh, that you've given us to come into your house and to learn more about you, worship you, and sing praises under your name. Dear God, be with us as we continue through this service. Help us open our hearts and minds to your word. Be with me as I deliver the message this morning. Again, we're mindful of all those that are sick. We just pray that you would reach down and touch them with their healing hand, dear Heavenly Father, so that they could all be with us again. Lord, we again, uh, we want to thank you for the many blessings you've given us, but we're so thankful, dear Father, for your Son and our Savior, Jesus. In his sweet and precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. There is an interesting book that has come out recently. And this book tells people how to deal with life's worst case scenarios. And of course the name of the book is the Worst Case Scenario Handbook. Um, but... This book has several chapters in it, and I'll just go through and read um, some of the things that this book tells you how to deal with. Um, there is a chapter on how to escape from quicksand. There is a chapter on how to hotwire a car, in case you ever have to do that. How to fend off a shark. How to escape from a bear. How to escape from a mountain lion. How to survive a poisonous snake attack. How to escape from killer bees. How to wrestle free from an alligator. How to deal with a charging bull. How to land an airplane. How to survive if your parachute doesn't open. How to survive an earthquake. How to survive when you're adrift at sea. How to perform a tracheotomy. How to take a punch. How to win at a sword fight. And how to jump from a moving car. Now, it's possible that we'll never face any of the scenarios that I just mentioned. But it is possible that you could find yourself in the same place that Job found himself. In Job's mind, the worst thing that could have happened, happened. 
Job lets us know that even when life was good and things were going his way, he was always afraid that something like this would take place. What Job faced in his life was a worst case scenario. What Job endured, um, as we read about in the book of Job, was horrible. But what Job learned was priceless. I want us to join Job this morning for a look at some of the lessons that can be learned from the experiences he had. What he learned will help you and me when we face the difficult days of life. And there are going to be difficult days of life. Sitting here this morning, some of us might have a worst case scenario in mind. That thing that we think that could be worse than anything else in our life. At the very least, there will be times when the bottom is going to fall out of your life. And you'll enter into this valley of affliction. When this happens, you need to know what to expect and how to react. The book of Job teaches us how to deal with life's worst case scenarios. There will be scenarios that we will face that aren't going to be covered in the little handbook that I mentioned uh, prior to starting this morning. But they are covered exhaustive, exhaustively in the word of the Lord. So let's take a brief journey through the life of Job this morning as we think together about the thought dealing with life's worst case scenarios. First, we want to look at what kind of man Job was. Uh, in the first chapter of the book of Job, uh, we see what the scripture says about him. And we even, it is written what God said about Job. Uh, if you look at me at Job chapter, one, with, with me at Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, uh, and then we'll jump down later in that chapter says, there was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep and goats, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the east. Now, Job had a lot of livestock. Uh, Sandy's got 14 chickens, and I think she's got a lot of, a lot of livestock. Um, but if we'll jump on down to verse 8, We'll see what God himself says about Job. God tells Satan, no one, no one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. So looking at our scripture this morning, uh, we know that Job lived a godly life. Job lived a good life. And Job lived a, best, a blessed life or grace life as well. Job was a good man and a rich man. He had definitely been blessed by the Lord. And a life lived for the Lord is a thing of beauty. When a person dedicates their life to the Lord, it brings in them in, into a position to experience the Lord's grace and his blessings 
in a fantastic, wonderful way. There's nothing in this world that can compare to a life lived in and for the will of God. Uh, a life lived for God is a life not wasted, but it's a life of value. It's a life that God can take and use to demonstrate his grace to a dying world. It's a life that God can hold up before Satan just as he did with Job and say, look at what I can do through grace. A godly life is a precious thing. It points the way to heaven. It shows the world that there is a better path for people to walk. And it's an example for youth. It's a life that is well lived. Now there is an illustration um, to communicate the value of holiness. Um, think about a bar of steel. Now a bar of steel is worth about $5. Now you can take that bar of steel and make horseshoes out of it and it's worth about $10 then if you get the horseshoes made. You can take that same bar of steel and make needles out of it and it's worth about $350. You can use that bar of steel to create the delicate springs that are in watches and that bar of steel will yield $250,000. But us as Christians are like that $5 bar of steel. Our commitment to holiness will determine whether we become Christians of minimal, moderate, or significant spiritual influence. Imagine the value of a godly life in our world today. How would you say that your life stacks up against Job's? It is possible, and it is the will of God for every person in this room to live a godly, a good, and a graced life. Are we doing that this morning? Now let's take a look at some of the calamities that befell Job. If you would this morning, we'll look back at Job, the first chapter again, and I am going to read verses 13 through 19 to begin with, and we'll see just exactly what happened to Job. Beginning with verse 13, it says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported, while the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabaeans swooped down and took them all away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While this messenger was still speaking, Another messenger came and reported, God's fire fell from heaven. It burned the sheep and the servants and devoured them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. That messenger was still speaking when yet another came and reported. The Chaldeans formed three bands made a raid on the camels and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That messenger was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on the young people so that they died and I alone have escaped to tell you. 
Now, Job had some terrible, horrible calamities befall him that day. Uh, Job had lost everything. He had lost his family. Uh, he had lost his fortune. Um, so, obviously, Job was devastated. But not only that, let's jump forward a little bit into chapter 2 and see what else happened to Job. Job chapter 2 and verse 7. So Satan left the Lord's presence and infected Job with terrible boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Not only had Job lost everything, now Job was ill with a terrible, painful illness. Job had some terrible calamities and illness befall him. Job lived a good and godly life, but still calamity came. His was a life blessed and graced by God, but trouble still stalked his life. Our text uh, the initial one we read when we began suggests that even during the good times of his life, Job lived in anticipation of a worst case scenario becoming reality. Job was kind of a worry wart. Even though he was blessed by God, he still worried that the worst would happen, and the worst did happen. And thank God, most of our worries are ill-founded. The majority of things um, that we all worry about in here never come to pass. Never come to pass. There was a young boy who was driving a hay wagon and that hay wagon overturned. Well, a farmer saw all this happen and the farmer came out and saw this young boy crying and he said, son, don't worry about this. We can fix it. Right now, dinner's ready. Why don't you come in and eat with us and not worry about this. And then we'll help you put that hay wagon back up and put the hay back on it. And that little boy said, no, I can't. My father is going to be very angry with me. The farmer said, now don't worry. Just come in and have some lunch and you'll feel better. The boy said, I'm just afraid my father's going to be angry with me. Eventually, the farmer convinced the young boy to go in and have lunch, and they ate lunch, and as they come back, the farmer said to the young boy, now don't you feel better after that great meal? And the boy said, yes, but I just know that my father's going to be angry with me. And that farmer said, now nonsense, where is your father anyhow? And a young boy said, he's under the wagon. Uh, so sometimes, now we have, that's a funny story now, but sometimes we have excessive worry beyond that point. Um, but it would do us good to remember that a good life is not a hedge against trouble. Being godly doesn't guarantee that we're going to be free from calamity in our lives. Uh, we seem to have the idea when we live life right um, that we're entitled to blessings. Uh, and this just isn't, isn't the case. Um, some of God's 
most precious followers have endured the greatest of afflictions. Uh, I mean, we can look at the Apostle Paul. Uh, we can look in, into the Old Testament, Daniel. We can look at the Hebrew three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were in the fiery furnace. We can look at David and look at the trials in his life. Even our Lord Jesus was called a man of sorrows in the book of Isaiah. Why should we feel that we're exempted from the troubles of life? Now, we really need to face the truth. And the truth is that bad things do happen to good people. Uh, and that's just a reality of life. But regardless what we expect life to bring along, we don't need to sit around and worry about it. Uh, there is never a place in our life for worry. Worry and needless cares show a profound lack of faith on our part on the ability of God. In fact, worry is a colossal waste of time. Mark Twain said, I have been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. Uh, now, let's look at the classroom of Job's life. Let's look at what Job learned and what we can learn. While God himself testified about the goodly and grace life of Job, God knew there were areas of Job's life that needed some attention. Uh, therefore, to work on these areas, God sent Job to this classroom of affliction. This man learned lessons that are not easily forgotten. He learned lessons that most of us need to learn as well. And allow me to share a few of them with you this morning. Job learned that no area of his life is safe from difficulty or disruption. The lesson in this is that our affections should be set a little higher than this world. Before his trials, Job was in love with God. He was a good and godly man. But also, Job was in love with all his stuff too. During his trials, Job learned a valuable lesson that God alone should be the object of our love and affection. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, we read uh, the words of Jesus, Matthew, chapter 6, 19 through 21. And Jesus says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What has your attention and your affection this morning? Is it God? Or is it all this stuff in the world. Job learned that God's purpose in trial is to break us, but to grow us. God doesn't want to punish us, but God wants to perfect us. Often, the best lessons in life are learned 
in the furnace of affliction. We can look in the book of Mark, I think chapter 6, and look at the disciples in the storm. Again, we can look at the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den. None of these individuals would have learned what God could do until they were put in a place that they needed God to do it. Job learned that God's purposes and plans for our lives are often beyond our comprehension. What God does and why he does it are things better left for him. Seeking to understand the reasons and the motives of the Lord for what he does and allows in our lives is like trying to understand how electricity works. Now, I, I was an electrician. Okay, I could make stuff work with electricity, but as far as telling you how it works and why it does, it was beyond my comprehension. You know, our minds have a hard time uh, grasping things sometimes. And in those times, I just think we need to sit back and enjoy it and not question it. Just accept it. Job learned that God is absolutely sovereign in all of life. Nothing happens to you or me without his permission. Remember, God's goal in every situation in life is your good and his glory. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, 28, we read, and we know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Job learned that in the end, all things worked out right. The Bible is clear when it tells us uh, in Romans chapter 8 and 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. In the end, all life's up and, up and downs will be perfectly blended into just what God intended for us in the first place. Now, I know all of us in here have been to Lowe's and carried these little uh, patches to the paint department uh, and took those patches back there uh, and wanted a particular shade. Now, we get back there and the person back there runs and gets red and orange and green and all kinds of different colors, shakes it all up, and they open it up, and here we are scratching our head asking how they got white out of all that. Um, <coughs> but that's just what God is doing. He's taken all the events in our life and he's given us what we need. Lastly this morning, uh, let's look at the completeness of Job's life. Let's see the result. What happened after Job was in the valley of affliction? It was a time of personal repentance for Job. Uh, in Job chapter 42, verse 30, 40, I mean, chapter 42, verse 6, we see Job say, I abhor myself and repent. Job says, I'm disgusted with myself and I'm sorry. Job finally came to realize that he hadn't been perfectly right because God had not been in absolute first place. It was a time of revival in Job's life. Notice that Job repented and was placed in the right relationship with God before the Lord blessed his life again. He didn't wait on fire or weather to get right with the Lord. 
uh, he had a revival in his heart when he was still in the valley. It was a time in Job's life of powerful restoration. God gave Job back double everything he'd lost. God blessed him in a mighty way. Uh, we're told uh, that Job later had ten more children. He had three daughters and seven sons. Now, there are some lessons that we can learn from Job's restoration. In fact, that's these lessons that should make the valleys bearable for us. And let me share them with you this morning. First, we should not wait until we're out of the valley and on the mountain before we deal with the sins and the problems that's in our lives. After all, the removal of these sins might be the object that's in the valley. We also need to remember that the valleys of life are merely God's classroom. God is training saints for greater service. He is preparing you to be used by him in a greater fashion and a greater way. And this always takes place in the valley. Next, when restoration has been achieved, we need to look for a way to praise God for the time we spent in the valley. Thank God for our blessings. Thank God for what we learned. Regardless of how dismal and dark the valley was, God was always there with us as we travel through it. In the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 13, verse 5, we read, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. God is always with us. And... Lastly, what we can be learned from Job's restoration is no matter how bad things become, they're not going to last forever. As you travel through your valley, remember that the exit is always just right ahead. Remember that what's going on didn't come to stay, but it merely came to pass. Job's worst case scenario became a reality. And when it did, he ran the usual gamut of human emotion. But God patiently worked in Job's heart to bring him to a place of restoration and usefulness. Now, I don't know what you're facing this morning. But I know that you're in one of three places. You're either in the valley, coming out of the valley, or going into the valley. And that sentence is true of every person here today. But something else is true as well. If you have the Lord in your life this morning, he is carefully working out his will in you. He doesn't allow your pain with joy but he does it to help you grow. In the book of Lamentations, uh, chapter 3, verses 31 through 33, we read, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, willingly nor grieve the children of men. Therefore, in your most difficult days, you can cast your cares upon the Lord. In the book of First Peter, we read, casting all your care upon him. You know why? Because he cares for you. This morning, if you don't know him, the worst...
possible scenario imaginable will come to pass in your life. If you're lost and you stay that way, you're going to spend your eternity in hell. Now, is that what you want? Come to Jesus, and he will save your soul today. Now, what is the worst-case scenario you can imagine? Jesus has a plan to take care of it. Why not bring it to him this morning? Let him have it. He's far better, better able to handle it than you ever will be. God has a plan for your salvation. We're to hear his word, believe his word, repent of our sins, confess his holy name, confess that we believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, be immersed in the watery grave of baptism, and live a faithful life. Christian life. If you don't know Jesus this morning, give your life to him today. As Mike leads us in our hymn of invitation this morning.